We've been defining and redefining what a notebook is and what a notebook can do. And today, we're going to do it again. Let me show it to you. The year is 2016. Apple just updated their beloved 2015 Retina MacBook Pros on stage with a sleek new laptop that looks more like a MacBook Air than a MacBook Pro. With a simplistic, minimalistic set of four USB-C connectors with no need for old legacy ports like HDMI, USB-A, and we won't need an SD card slot in the wireless future. Complete with a thin, sleek, ultra low profile butterfly keyboard with low travel and stability and a futuristic display on the top strip of the keyboard that replaces the function key row and can be replaced with any button or slider or hey, even doom. You're probably wondering how we got here today. 2016 might be the year Apple fans point back to as the year the company dropped the ball and for four years we suffered a dark age of Mac development, design, and quite frankly, neglect. You see, the history of Apple's decisions here are quite complicated and we may never know what ultimately led to what many Mac fans consider Apple's neglect of the platform from 2016 to 2020. From that time period, we saw Apple create underwhelming new MacBook Pro designs, get out of the display business by shipping the repulsive LG Ultrafine 5K, ship a defective butterfly keyboard, introduce a new user interface without any significant new hardware or software attention paid to it for five years, ship Macs that just couldn't handle the power of the chips that were put inside of them, and even discontinue what I think were forward-looking Mac designs like the 12 inch MacBook and admit total defeat with Apple self-admitting they boxed themselves into a thermal design constraint with what was supposed to be their most powerful desktop computer, the 2013 Mac Pro. But the biggest mistake of this era of Macs wasn't the 12 inch MacBook or the discontinuation and rebirth of the Mac Pro, but the biggest mistake of this era was taking the MacBook Pro and turning the direction of that product from a pro product into more of a sleek computer that would appeal to the masses rather than a MacBook that was purpose built for the professionals that relied on it every single day. And this happened in multiple ways. Firstly, it was the removal of the ports that many professionals use. The 2015 MacBook Pro came with a good port selection of two Thunderbolt ports, two USB-A ports, an HDMI port, a dedicated charging port for MagSafe, and beloved by professional photographers, and uh, not to be biased, but YouTubers also, an SD card slot. The 2016 era stripped all of that away for four Thunderbolt USB-C ports. Granted, these ports themselves were amazing, giving the ability to transfer data very quickly with its fast connections and being versatile enough to be adapted to any other port you would want. So with a dongle or an adapter, you could change that port into an HDMI or an SD card slot. However, the quality of these dongles and adapters were inconsistent to say the least. I've had good adapters from third parties like Anchor, but other third party ones I've used and even some of Apple's main adapters like their SD card adapter could be flaky at times, requiring me to replug them in to actually get a stable connection. Built-in ports on the machine are just more reliable, and if you forget the dongle or adapter, well, you already have the HDMI port or SD card slot built into the MacBook Pro, so there's always something to plug into. You don't have to make sure you put it in your bag. I get what Apple was going for, though. They thought they could move the industry forward by envisioning a world where everyone used USB-C as the primary connector, which is a really good connector, so that dongles and adapters after a few years of growing pains wouldn't be necessary anymore. And while there's certainly more USB-C devices and peripherals today than there was in 2016, uh, that future just never happened, and you don't see TV manufacturers using USB-C as the main connection, and we still get tons of PC monitors that just use HDMI or DisplayPort, and hey, most cameras still use an SD card slot. The 2021 MacBook Pro is an admission that the future that Apple foresaw never came, and possibly might never come true. And its decision to reinstate popular ports like MagSafe for dedicated charging and HDMI for easy video out, along with an SD card slot for importing photos and videos, is perhaps the biggest admission we are ever going to get from them that they were wrong. A second issue for Apple, and perhaps an unforeseen one, was the butterfly keyboard. A keyboard that I self-admittedly liked the typing experience on because of how precise those keys were, especially for short burst sessions of typing. But the keyboard was 
divisive, with some people loving the shallow key travel and others quite frankly hating it. Not only was that keyboard divisive in the pro world, but it was also unreliable for many users, resulting in stuck or broken keys. The butterfly keyboard itself went through four different iterations in its lifetime, even with different material changes or the addition of a silicone membrane to prevent dust from getting into the keyboard, it still never really fixed the ultimate problem of the butterfly keyboard, and it was ultimately removed with the introduction of the beloved and trustworthy Magic Keyboard, which itself featured a slight alteration from the older Magic Keyboards of the 2015 MacBook Pro, offering a middle ground of travel with the old MacBook Pro keyboards, but with the precision and tactile feeling of the butterfly keyboard. Importantly, it reverted to the old scissor switch mechanisms instead of the butterfly mechanisms, which were just more reliable than the butterfly keyboard design and easily replaceable. One thing that lived beyond the butterfly keyboard was Apple's touch bar, a thin display at the top of the keyboard that replaced the function key row. When it was introduced, it was touted as a revolutionary new user interface for the Mac that could add touchscreen elements into the keyboard where your hands naturally rest, rather than a display sitting up vertically that you would have to reach up and touch. And while I think the idea had some merit and some good use cases, the touch bar was basically just neglected after the 2016 launch. Apple never iterated or improved the touch bar in any significant way. The touch bar became less prevalent actually as the Magic Keyboard returned to the MacBook Pro in 2019 because it removed the escape key from the touch bar and added back a physical escape key. It was like Apple thought, hey, this is an interesting idea. They shipped it, and then they quickly realized, oh wait, we don't actually like this, so let's not improve upon it at all. I think that was the biggest problem with the touch bar. It was an okay concept, but it could have been much better, especially if Apple iterated on it, like maybe added some of their excellent haptics like they have on the iPhone and the MacBook trackpads. They could have tried to make the keys on those strips feel more like physical buttons. But again, nothing was ever improved upon, and the 2021 era of MacBook Pros have just simply reverted back to the function key row, and a full-size function key row at that. Finally, and most importantly, it was the body design of the 2016 era MacBook Pros that was a key cause of the problems it faced. It focused on a thin and light design, so much so in fact that the 2016 MacBook Pro was technically thinner than the previous MacBook Air if you compared both products at their thickest points. Even the weight of the 13-inch model was directly comparable to that of the MacBook Air, weighing in at the same 3-pound weight. For reference, the 2015 13-inch model weighed 3.5 pounds, and now the 2021 14-inch model also weighs 3.5 pounds. I wonder if that was a coincidence. Now, in some ways, you could argue, depending on your use case, maybe you might have preferred a thinner and lighter product. And if we take a look at products in general, there are always pros and cons to devices, and you could say that these MacBooks being thin and light was a pro. But while a thinner and lighter design is usually better from a design perspective, it isn't better if the main function of these laptops is to exceed at performance and be a pro level product. However, it is notable that when these MacBook Pros launched in their 2016 design iterations, they came with less power hungry and thermally compromised dual-core processors on the 13-inch model and quad-core processors on the 14-inch model. And we really only ran into the major thermal constraints with these designs in the 2018 era, when Apple jumped up to quad-core processors on the 13-inch model and a six-core processor on the 15-inch model. The biggest issue with these designs was Apple's reliance on Intel. And you can kind of see how Apple might have thought the 2016 era of design would be good enough thermally based on what they were working on with their own chip design going into the iPhone and iPad and the promises from Intel that they would have 10 nanometer chips ready for 2017 and 2018. However, that 10 nanometer design was delayed and delayed and delayed and delayed. So for that whole era of MacBooks, Apple, I assume, designed that product with the idea that Intel would be able to match what they were doing with their own A-series Apple Silicon chips, and it just never happened. So much so, in fact, that the latest M1 Pro and M1 Max processors are built on a 5 nanometer process, while Intel just launched their 10 nanometer chips, and we are already hearing rumors that next year, TSMC will be manufacturing 3 nanometer chips for Apple. In fact, when we take a step back and look at this all through hindsight, perhaps the biggest mistake that Apple fixed wasn't the body design, it wasn't removing the touch bar or adding back ports, 
It was dropping Intel and deciding to invest in building their own custom chips for the Mac, which have just been groundbreaking in performance and efficiency, giving us amazing performance in our laptops with amazing battery life and thermal designs that don't ramp up the fans and don't run hot in everyday use. It was Apple taking more control of their product's destiny that really fixed a lot of their problems by controlling one of the most important aspects of designing their products, the chips that run them. So they could design form factors and use cases that they could never do by using a third party silicon vendor like Intel, making the products and features they wanna make just like they do with the iPhone and the iPad. And yes, while Apple has fixed their biggest mistake, there are still elements of Mac neglect that are still living with us, and Apple still has a few more mistakes to fix. Adding a worthy consumer level display that doesn't cost $5,000 without a stand would be one of them, and replacing the last of their Intel Macs this year with even more powerful versions of custom Apple Silicon. Either way, there were a lot of mistakes with the 2016 to 2020 era of MacBook Pro design, and after four dark years of what felt like neglect for the Mac, Apple has fixed their biggest mistake to their Mac customers with the 2021 MacBook Pro. Bringing back the ports, removing the touch bar, adding thickness for more battery capacity and better cooling, and giving the power we deserve on pro level machines. But anyway, that's what I think. So let me know what you think in the comments below. Do you agree with me that Apple has now fixed their biggest mistake? And do you like the design direction that the 2021 MacBook Pros went with? Also, if you like this video, be sure to give me a like. If you wanna see more from the channel, make sure you're subscribed. And as always, thank you so much for watching this video and I will see you all in the next one. Take care, everyone.